We live in a time of a very short attention span. Would you agree with that? Our attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And the reason we showed you this TikTok video or several of these is to make an illustration to show you that uh, our attention span drifts. Uh, you saw there several TikTok videos kind of mashed together. And uh, on TikTok, it's only about 60 seconds that you get to make a video to put it on there. And it has taken the world by storm, especially in the last year. Uh, did you know this? There's a young man that is on TikTok and he does this Harry Potter kind of thing. And his video has, this one video has been watched 2.2 billion times. 2.2 billion times. Let me say that again. 2.2 billion times. I have no idea why anybody would want to watch it once, much less 2.2 billion times. But I really believe that it illustrates how that we have a tendency in our minds to drift, not to stay focused. We have a tendency to go from one thing to the next to the next, to the next, and we really have a hard time focusing or staying focused. You may think that that's a normal thing, and I believe it is human nature for our attention to drift, but did you know that it's also a normal thing and something that happens to every one of us that spiritually speaking, our attention will drift. We tend to drift spiritually. Now, what I mean by that is that our attention and that our focus tends to drift. Some people call it backsliding. Some people call it getting cold in your relationship with the Lord. Some people call it being in wintertime in your relationship with God. But the bottom line is this. There are many Christians that drift in their focus and they get bored. They get tired. They get burned out or simply just cold in their faith. And if you've never experienced that as a believer, chances are you have not been a believer very long because every one of us has this tendency toward drifting. We have this tendency toward our focus being where it should not be and we'll drift from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. There are some people that, as I said, they drift. They don't quit. They just lose focus and faithfulness. Others drift to the point that they stop reading the Bible. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many of us, and I say us, have had difficulty being faithful at some point in our life of reading the Bible consistently? The fact is, we all drift. We all lose attention. We all lose focus. There are those that will stop reading the Bible, they'll stop praying, they'll stop giving, they'll stop serving, and some even to the point of stopping going to church. Then there are others that drift to the point of a shipwrecked faith. I've seen this so many times in my many years of being a pastor now. There are people that they don't think that they're going to drop out, they don't think they're going to quit, they don't think that they will lose focus to the point where they are not faithful any longer, but I've seen it happen so many times. It is so easy, so easy to stop. Stop going to church. Particularly in a, a challenge like we've had for the last 14 months. For so many people that have been uh, isolated from one another at, due to COVID-19, it is extremely easy for us to drift. I want you to hear what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. The Apostle Paul was writing this to a young man. Timothy was a young pastor. Actually, Paul appointed Timothy to pastor a church that he had started. And here's what he said to Timothy. He said, cling to your faith in Christ. Do you get that idea that as a believer, we've got to cling, we've got to hold on? Not easy to hold on sometimes. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences and as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Well, my goal today is to help you to avoid shipwreck in your faith. It's help you to learn, to learn how to navigate those waters of your spiritual life when your attention drifts. 
when your focus maybe isn't quite what it should be. To keep you from drifting in your faith, you've got to become more like Christ, and you've got to become mature in your faith. And so today I want to show you what the book of Hebrews says about keeping a laser focus on Jesus. So this is for you, no matter where you are in your faith. If you're a new believer, you need to learn this because you need to learn how to grow and become more like Jesus. If you're like I am and have been a a believer for about 48 years now, it's hard for me to believe. I've been a believer in Christ for about 48 years, but you know what? Even a pastor, even someone that's been a Christian as long as I have, needs to remind ourselves, I need to remind myself of what it means to keep my attention on Jesus, to keep my eyes on Jesus, and how to avoid drifting to the point that I drop out of the game. Well, it's a very familiar passage we're going to read today in Hebrews chapter 12. Only two verses. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, let me hit the pause button. Anytime you see that word, therefore, in the Bible, you need to discover what it's there for. All right? And so, therefore, refers back to chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. And if you know much about your Bible, you know that Hebrews chapter 11 is what we call the Faith Hall of Fame. It's where a bunch of people that had faith, the Bible mentions them of how that they were able to survive in spite of their difficult circumstances. They were able to survive in their relationship with God in spite of all the obstacles that came their way, in spite of their failures. And you can read this list. There's not a single one on that list that did not fail, and we've got a record of it in the Bible. But every single one of them, they survived. You know how? because they kept their eyes on Jesus. You say, wait a minute, some of these were in the Old Testament, they didn't even know who Jesus was, that's true. But through faith, they had a relationship with God and they believed what God said and as a result of that, they were able to make it through. Therefore, because of that, because of these great cloud of witnesses that we have seen, he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let me just once again hit the pause button. Maybe you were taught or you've heard or maybe you just think this, that when believers die, that they go to heaven, and according to this, it sounds like that this cloud of witnesses, that they're watching what we do. They're watching us when we go to church or when we don't. They're watching us when we say good things or when we slip up and say bad things. They're watching us when we're nice to our spouse or when we're not. They're watching us when we sin or when we do not. That's not what that means. Because I want you to think about that. That would be rather creepy, wouldn't it? I mean, think about it. If everybody in heaven is watching you 24-7, that would be weird. They're watching you when you go to the bathroom. I don't really care for somebody watching me when I go to the bathroom, okay? Well, that's not what this means. This idea of a great cloud of witnesses simply means that they were witnesses to the efficiency of faith, to the sufficiency of their faith in God. They were witnesses to the faithfulness of God. And as a result, this cloud of witnesses has been given to us to follow their story. So in other words, what the Bible is teaching us here is this. There are these people that we've learned their story We've seen their past, and we've seen how that though they were not perfect, that their faith kept them in the game. Their faith kept them from drifting. Their faith kept them in a right relationship with God. So let's read it together. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, these people that have showed us that faith works, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus I want you to say that with me ready looking to Jesus say it again looking to Jesus this is the key to understanding this passage God wants us to look to Jesus looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith he's the one that got it started He's the one that's going to complete it in us. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, today I want to give you just a few thoughts on how to keep from drifting in your faith. I want you to finish well. I don't want you to be one of those believers that just starts out okay, but doesn't finish your race. You're you're not going to be perfect. And you're not going to get it right every single day of your life. I want you to understand that. Because after you become a believer, even though God puts the new man inside of you, the Holy Spirit lives in you, God himself indwells you, but the truth of the matter is we still have a sin nature. And that sin nature rears its ugly head. And he causes us to do things that maybe we don't want to do in our spiritual nature, but that old nature is still with us until we are united with God in heaven after this earthly life that we have is done. So today, I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about how to keep from drifting in your faith. Number one, you need to encourage yourself in the Lord. You got to encourage yourself in the Lord because if you don't, you will get discouraged and quit. I want you to see what uh, the author of Hebrews wrote. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. You know what he's saying there? That we've got to look at others that have survived. We've got to look at others that have thrived in their faith. We've got to look at others that have gone before us and encourage our heart by reading about them. And it's not just that. We read from the Bible, and that's why it's so important for you to read the Bible. But we read from the Bible about these stories of people that were real people. And we see them as heroes. Sometimes we think of them as superheroes in the faith, but that's not what they were. They were just faithful. That's it. They were faithful. There is no such thing in the Bible uh, about a superhero Christian. These are all people that had flaws. They had warts. They had shortcomings. They had sin in their life. And yet, God blessed them. Why? Because they followed the testimony that God gave us. You know what you and I need to learn to do? We need to learn to read the Bible and encourage ourselves in the Lord. But that's not only the way you do it. You also get encouragement from other believers that are contemporaries of yours. And so when you come and you serve at Avalon Church, guess what you're doing? You're encouraging yourself in the faith. Every time you volunteer, you're encouraging yourself in the faith. Every time you go to a small group and you are encouraged by others in that small group, you know what you're doing? You're lifting yourself up. You're encouraging yourself in the Lord. You're making sure that you are not going to drift and get out of the game. You know, you and I must learn to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Um, There are times that people are going to try to discourage you. In fact, we all have experienced that. And if you became a follower of Jesus as an adult, you'll have people in your life that are going to try to tell you that what you're doing is crazy. They're just taking so much of your time down at that church. And don't you listen to that. You encourage yourself in the Lord with other believers and with what the Word of God teaches us. You want to stay in the game? Encourage yourself in the Lord. Here's the second thing you've got to see from this passage. You've got to simplify your life and learn the power of no. He says there, let us also lay aside every weight. Now there's some scholars that believe that the word weight and the word sin in this passage are synonyms. I don't happen to believe that. I think a weight is something that is not necessarily a sin, but it can distract us from serving God. It can distract us in our faith. For example, Let's say that uh, there's something in your life that you enjoy doing. Let's just say golf. You enjoy playing golf, and um, you enjoy it so much that you play a couple times a week. And nothing sinful about golf, nothing wrong with golf. In fact, it's good exercise for old men. And uh, I kind of got that dig in there because I don't play. Uh, But uh, the fact is, you know, if you want to consider yourself an athlete, golf is the game for an old man to consider himself an athlete, all right? But, you know, if you're going to, um, if you're going to 
uh, learn how to play the game of golf and you're going to uh, succeed at golf, you've got to learn to uh, lay aside the things that distract you. What happens, however, for us with good things like the game of golf, you can get to the point where you allow that to come between you and serving God. Maybe you say, well, I'm just going to play this Sunday because and, and, uh, it's such a beautiful day and we're going to play just today. And then next week you say, well, we're going to do that same thing again. And before you know it, you have had this whole uh, series of Sundays where you haven't been in church, you haven't been uh, using your gifts for God, you haven't been serving, and as a result, what happens? You begin to drift in your faith. Now, once again, is there anything wrong with playing golf? No. In fact, if you enjoy it, I encourage you to play it. Um, and, And we could use many, many different things to show and to illustrate how that something that is good in our life can become a weight. Did you know that things that are good but not best can become a weight in your life? Did you know that your schedule can become a weight in your life? Most people don't really think of it in these terms. They're so busy. They think, well, I'm just so busy, I can't really get to church. Or I can't really have time to volunteer and serve at church because I am so busy. Well, what you need to learn that in your relationship with God, in your faith relationship, if you are going to make it through and not drift in your faith, you must learn how to say no. A lot of people don't realize the importance of the word no. You've got to learn to say no to something. Here's what I do know. If you're busy, then you have to make choices. You have to make priorities in your life. You cannot continue to add things to your schedule without taking something else away from your schedule. You won't make it. This is what I found for many people who struggle to read their Bible or struggle to have their devotions. They just try to pile it on to all the other stuff they've already got going on without taking something away. Well, you won't be faithful if you do that. If you're going to be faithful to church, you've got to learn to say no to something that you could be doing during that time. So you've got to simplify your life and learn the power of no. I did not know that as a young man. I just thought that, you know, there are 24 hours in a day, and uh, we can uh, fill every one of those hours with something that's busy. And just because you are busy does not mean that you are serving God with your life. Just because you're busy does not mean that you're doing the right thing. It can be a weight in your life, your schedule, until you learn to manage that schedule and to say no to something, uh, you cannot continue to add things to your schedule and be successful. You just simply can't do it. So you got to learn the power of no. Here's the third thing we've got to do if we're going to continue to keep from drifting. We've got to embrace repentance as a lifestyle. He says there, and lay aside the sin which clings so closely. In the old King James Version, it says, the sin which so easily besets us. And you've probably heard that uh, phrase, that term before, a besetting sin. And I do believe that we all have besetting sins. Uh, For example, there are certain sins that I'm not tempted with at all. I'm not tempted to steal I just am not. I, I, you know, uh, that's probably a good thing as a pastor that I'm not tempted to steal. Uh, But the fact is, I am tempted with other things in my life. But stealing is not something that's going to trip me up. You know, there are certain things that uh, in my life that just are not temptations to me that are to other people. Now, a besetting sin is the sin which so easily besets you or it clings closely so that it trips you That's one of the reasons why I believe Jesus was so adamant that we not judge with a judgmental heart other people's lives. Does not mean, now when Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, do not interpret that the way most people do, which says you cannot point out sin, you cannot recognize wrong, because that is not what that means. I mean, the fact is, uh, that statement in and of itself is a judgment, 
Judge not that you be not judged. That is a judgment, okay? So it can't possibly mean that we can never recognize sin. What it means is that I am not to be a hypocrite and to try to point out other people's sin while not recognizing the sin in my own life, okay? And so what the Bible is clear on is this. We must embrace repentance as a lifestyle. Now, one thing about the word repentance is it is uh, misused and misunderstood in our culture today. The word repentance simply means to agree with God. It means to turn and go his direction. There is not something ugly about repentance. In fact, there's something beautiful about repentance. It is one of the greatest uh, things that we have in our life as believers. We can agree with God. Yes, Lord, I realize that losing my temper like that, being sinful in the words that I said to my wife, that's not right. I want to agree with you, God, and I want to line my life up with you. You see how that works? What we must do is learn to embrace repentance as a lifestyle. Let me read uh, this verse 1 from the Living Bible. I think it gives a little bit of commentary about what we just read. Uh, in the Living Bible, Hebrews 12, 1 says, Let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back. What is it in your life that slows you down or holds you back? And especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. You're going to have a besetting sin. You're going to have something that tempts you more than other people necessarily are tempted by that particular thing. Learn to embrace repentance as a lifestyle. Learn not to be judgmental the way Jesus said, don't be judgmental with our attitude, pretending that we have no sin while we point out the sins of others. We must learn how to embrace repentance. If you don't embrace repentance, you know what's going to happen is you're going to set yourself up to drift. You're going to set yourself up to fail. You're going to set yourself up to fall. Here's the fourth thing we've got to learn to do. Don't get impatient. Don't get impatient. He said, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In some translations, that word endurance reads patience. Did you know that for many people, um, they don't understand that the Christian life takes time. It's not automatic. And it's certainly not immediate. In the same way, because the Bible uses the metaphor of being born again, well, when you have a little baby, you don't expect that baby uh, after you brought it home, all right, you're going to get one week to rest, and then after that, you're going to get a job, all right? Because you know what? I'm tired of you just laying around here pooping all the time and uh, eating all the time and taking up all of our resources. You got to go get a job and help contribute to this household. Well, nobody would do that. You know why? Because a baby's not capable of that. That would be silly. In the same way, there are so many Christians that don't understand that the Christian life requires patience. It takes time. It's not going to be, you're not going to be perfect immediately. In fact, you're not ever going to be perfect until you get to heaven. And so we must learn not to get impatient with each other and with our own life. Listen to what he said. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now I want to just kind of break that down a little bit. Let us run. Do you know that God has called us to be in the game? God has called us, one of the things we say uh, here at Avalon Church is that participation is membership. God wants you to participate. He wants you to be a part of the local church. Why? Because we got to run our race. Let us run. God has given you a task. He has given you a job. He has given you a calling. Let us run. Then he said, let us run with endurance. Be patient. Be patient with your brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not perfect and neither are you. But be patient in your own life. Pray. Seek God. Don't drift. And in doing that, you're going to be able to grow in your faith. But guess what? It's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to be a spiritual giant overnight. It's just like in a, a baby. It takes a baby a long time to grow and be a mature adult. I started to say it takes 18 years. It takes more like 30, all right? So uh, the truth is that you and I must be patient. And then he says, let us run with endurance 
the race that is set before us. You have a race to run. You have a calling on your life. You have a specific job that God wants you to do that I cannot do for you. You've got to learn to be patient, to grow, to realize that the Christian life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And just because you get saved, uh, yes, you're going to be excited. You're going to grow. God's going to change your life. You're a new creation. But guess what happens? you got to be patient because what's going to happen after you become a believer, a follower of Christ, you're going to find yourself that you still sin, that you still mess up. And you're going to be like, well, I thought I got saved. I, I thought God came into my life. Well, he did, but you got to be patient. You see, salvation is instantaneous, but sanctification, which is growing and maturing in your faith, takes a lifetime. So be patient, be patient. Here's the next thing. You got to focus on Jesus daily, daily. Remember I said you got to encourage yourself in the Lord? One of the ways to do that is to focus on Jesus daily. It says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. The founder and perfecter. We got to look to Jesus every day of our life. From the New Living Translation, it reads this way. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus on whom our faith depends from start to finish. If you ever begin to think that your faith, your faithfulness, your growth depends solely on you, then you're going to fall. You're going to drift because it does not depend solely on you. You got to keep your eyes on Jesus. And when you do that, Jesus starts your faith, but he also finishes your faith. What does it mean that Jesus starts our faith? Well, he did the work on the cross. He died in our place. He redeemed us. He made salvation possible through his work on the cross. So he started it. He gives us the faith to trust him. He saves us, but thank God, he doesn't just save you and leave you. He's there with you every step of the way, and he promises that he will bless you and be with you. Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Then number six, if you want to avoid drifting, if you want to stay in the game, if you want to finish, if you want to be more like Christ, if you want to grow in your faith, always remember the why. The why. Let me read this to you from today's English version. It's a different version, but the same content, basically. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 and 3, it says, Jesus did not give up because of the cross. He could have. He could have said, this is too much, but he did not. He didn't give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him. Now, was the cross joyous? No, not on your life. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He said the joy there that was waiting for him, you know what it was? It was you and me. It was that we would be a part of his family, that he would save us, that we would be in fellowship with him. That was the joy. He thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated at the right hand of the right side of God's throne. Think of what he went through, how he put up with so much hatred from sinners, so do not let yourself become discouraged or give up. You want to keep yourself from giving up? You want to keep yourself from drifting? Look to Jesus and remember the why. Why does he want us to live for him? Why does he change our lives? Why does he save us? Why does he call us? Why does he give us a task, a race to run? It's because that he's going to pour out his grace on us for all of eternity. In the book of Ephesians, it talks about that, that for all of eternity, he's just going to show out and show off. He's going to show the grace of God. The Father is going to be with us and bless us. And so remember the why. Whenever you get discouraged and tired, Remember, Jesus didn't give up, and he is with us, and so we don't have to give up either. Remember that he rewards us. Remember the why. The reason we serve God is not to please the pastor. If you think that your goal as a believer or as a Christian is to make me happy, then you've got it backwards. It's not to make me happy. It's to make God happy. It's to make Jesus happy. And so remember why we do what we do. 
Always remember the why. And then finally, actively participate with a team. And that team is the church. You want to stay in the game? Participate with the church. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. By the way, do you get that? Love. Anybody need more love in their life? Anybody need to be more loving? Anybody need to show other people more of the love of Jesus Christ in your life? I know I do. Uh, If you need more of that, anybody need help doing good deeds? Anybody need help serving God? Anybody need help with that? He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. How do you do it? Let us not give up meeting together, as some of you are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another as you see the day approaching. Notice the word day is capitalized. That's talking about the day of Jesus' return. And so he's got this reminder for us. We've got to remember that we're working toward the day. Now, maybe that day will be that Jesus comes back before you die. Maybe you die before Jesus comes back. The Bible is very clear that believers who die in Christ will be resurrected one day and reunited uh, with a resurrected body and will be with the Lord forever. So we're looking forward to the day, the day that we see Jesus, whether it's through death and you meet him face to face the first time or whether it's he comes back and we meet him face to face the first time that way. But he said, remember the day. But what do we do in the meantime? We've got to actively encourage each other. That's why it's so important to be faithful to church. That's why it's so important to attend. Why? Because it will spur you toward love and toward good deeds. And this is the call that God has on my life and on yours. I wonder today if you would say, Pastor, you know, I've never been saved. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Maybe you're confused about the gospel. The gospel is very clear and it's very succinct. Uh, Even though it's very simple, it's also very complex. The fact is, Jesus died on the cross. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He became our representative, both as a human and as God. And he died on the cross for our sins. But that was not the end. He resurrected from the grave three days later having conquered sin, death, and the grave. And he offers to you and to me salvation. And so today, maybe you'd say, Pastor, you know, I need, I need this salvation. I need Jesus. Those of you watching online and those of you in the room today, I would encourage you to pray and receive Christ if you need to do that today. Those of you online, you can click the button there online and acknowledge that you received Christ. Those of you in the room, you can fill out a next step card. We'll tell you about that in a moment. But if you would like to receive Christ, maybe something like this, you need to say in a prayer to God, dear God, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sin. And I'm asking you to save me right now. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave and I'm asking you to be my savior right now. Did you know that when you cry out to God, He promises not only to save you, but to give you the faith that is necessary to be saved? And that's the good news, is that when you ask, that's why it says in Romans, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God promises that when you call out, He will answer. Maybe you're already a Christian today, but you'd say, Pastor, I feel like I've drifted. I feel like I need to do fill in the blank more. Maybe it's read the Bible. Maybe it's pray more. Maybe it's share your faith more. Maybe it's be more faithful to church. Maybe it's uh, uh, something more with your family life. I need to communicate with my spouse more. I need to be a better leader in my home. I need to do a better job with my testimony at my work. But I wonder today if you'd say, Pastor, there's something in my life that God spoke to me about today, and I need to do that more. And I want you to pray that God would keep me from drifting. Would you just raise your hand, anybody like that in the room today? I need to do, and you don't have to say what it is, more. God bless you. Father, I pray that you would help all of us to call on you and to trust you to do whatever it is you've called us to do. Help us to be faithful and not to drift. In Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. 
You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.